Ladies and gentlemen, here to welcome you to Centennial Central is AGU's president, Robin Bell. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Wow, isn't this amazing? We've been talking about this for over, I don't know, three years? About what it would look like when we celebrated 100 years. I'm Robin Bell. I'm president of the American Geophysical Union, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. It's so remarkable when we think that 100 years ago, when AGU was founded, what a different place our planet was, our scientific community was, and we've had a century of discovery. When the council first started thinking about this, we realized when 100 years ago, we didn't know about plate tectonics, we didn't know the age of the Earth, we didn't know that we could change climate. Our view of the planet has completely altered in that 100 years. Things we now take for granted, we just didn't have a framework to think about. Whether it's where we find volcanoes, what it is that makes them, what it is that makes the earthquakes that we know happen, and what it is that makes the ocean and climate engine of our planet work. All of those knowledge that we've gained has led to a safer place for us to live. It's the building codes that have made this building safer for us to be in, even though we're in a, an earthquake-prone place. It's our science that's making our planet a better place for humanity to be. In that spirit, what we're going to hear over this week on this stage is reflections on the accomplishments of AGU and AGU science, and looking forward on how our science can both address those societal and scientific challenges that face us all. So in the, in the spirit of the centennial, we've really worked to transform and improve our world by sharing our science more with the public, something that wasn't part of the culture 100 years ago, showing decision makers the value of our science, sharing it with community members, and making sure that we lay the foundation for building the next generation of scientists leaders, and even figuring out a way to infuse our scientific knowledge into the broader fabric of our communities. The Centennial has touched on almost every facet of AGU. We've had the grant program where we've engaged, this is remarkable, more than a million people around the world to amplify the accomplishments of everything we've learned in the last hundred years in Earth and Space Science through the Austin Challenge Grant, we have 15 more students who are in this building who wouldn't have been otherwise. And to date, over 3,000 gifts have come in from AGU members with more than a half a million dollars. We should still see if we can meet that million dollar goal because think of the other 15 students who could come every year if we can meet that goal. We've also really moved forward in our diversity, ethics, and inclusion an equity program. We started an ethics center with nine partners, and we're providing resources and continuing to see if we can make our community, the Earth and Space Science community, basically a beacon on how we can do science and be open, welcoming, and fair. We started a new journal, AGU Advances, which is going to be gold open access with the first issues coming out next year. And we, in, we renovated our Washington, D.C. headquarters as the first net zero building. And it's a place for us to be very proud of. When everybody, anybody asks me, what am I doing about climate change and how am I stepping forward? I speak of what I do individually, but I also quickly point to the AGU building and what we as a community have chosen to do. And you sh should remember when you're in Washington, D.C., there's a lovely members lounge with an espresso machine. So you should make sure you come there, use it, and think about holding meetings there. We've already had 10,000 people use the meeting space there. So please remember that we have a space in Washington that we can all use. So this is going to be a hub all week to celebrate our discovery and foster discussions about the future. We're going to hear 
from the entire neighborhoods from the council. And we hope we're going to see remarkable talks, remarkable conversations, and a new way to experiment with exchanging ideas. This is not your grandmother's poster and oral session, right? We're trying something new. Um, the major themes you're going to hear are about the dynamic Earth, it's the habitability, our changing Earth, the future of space or exploration, the importance of diversity in the sciences, and how sciences inspires people to solve problems. There are more than 100 AGU scientists who organized through the council to put this together to create this centennial programming here through the neighborhoods. I'd also like to, so I'd like to thank them because it was a lot of work for them. I'd also like to thank AGU's Centennial Steering Committee who provided leadership and service and incredible amount of time over the last couple of years putting this vision together on how we can both celebrate and look to the future. I'd like to personally thank you for everything you've done in your really important role. Now we've given them a hand. I'd actually like to ask the members of the Centennial Committee to stand up. I know it's kind of dark, but this way we'll get a sense who they are and that they're actually, and especially to Tim. It's really been, yeah, I think it's remarkable because it's, you know, when anybody says there's a centennial, it's like, oh, well, are we just gonna have a party? But this isn't just a party, it's a party with sharing and learning. And I think that's all we love to do is learn more. And I think that's one of the, the things through the process ever since the council started this, realizing how much we can share and learn from one another. So from today until four on Thursday, I encourage you to keep on visiting, see what's up with your Centennial app, and there's an entire thread on your app of what you can do. So I'd like to thank all the organizers again, and for enjoy the week for celebrating AGU Centennial. And today we're gonna start with the Earth's interior. That's why we have this lovely lava flow here behind us. I should have worn, I have a scarf with a lava flow on it. If I'd realized this beautiful, image of lava flow was going to be here, I would have worn my lava scarf. But since I don't have my lava scarf, I'll have to introduce Dominique Weiss, who, you know, is one of the classic examples of how we as earth scientists have this incredible way to look broadly. Dominique not only studies the deep interior, but she's going to carry home jars of my honey to find out what the load of metals and other things in the New York City area. So it just shows you how incredibly broad that you can be a scientist who thinks of the deep inner earth, but you can also think, use those same technologies to understand how our planet works. So Domini, thank you very much for organizing today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Robin. So I'm uh, Dominique Weiss, VGP president-elect, and it's my pleasure to open the first session of Centen Centennial Central. So we have Earth Interior. That means seven sections are going to have talks, keynotes, panel discussions through the day, and our t topics are framed around habitability. So we're going from the accretion, which is the first se session, to the geodynamo, differentiation of the planet, ingredients for life, to hazards, fluids, and resources, and energy. So our first speaker today is Dr. Anat Shaha from the Carnegie Institution, and she will present the, the plenary talk, followed by four flash talks and a panel discussion. The floor is yours, Anna. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you. Oh, it's very bright. Um, all right. I'm honored and thrilled to be giving the first talk on this stage. Thank you for being here. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is accretion of a habitable planet, and the accretion of the Earth in particular. I'd like to focus on the point of view of the past, the present, and the future. And as this is the AGU centennial, I'd really like to touch on the role of the AGU in understanding the research over the past 100 years. 
A lot of tremendous re research has occurred in the past 100 years, from the very first image of the Earth in space, uh, just in 1946, not that long ago, to a direct image of an exoplanet orbiting a star in another solar system very far away. In just 70 years, we've gone um, this far technological, technologically. So I'd like to start with accretion. Accretion of the Earth is basically just the accumulation of particles into a massive object. It, we can start by look, accretion begins with the uh, formation of a star and the star starting to burn. So our sun starts to burn. And accretion ends when a planet is fully formed. CAIs, calcium aluminum rich inclusions, set the stage for the time zero, the first condensates in our solar system. So T equals zero is the formation of these um, first condensates, these CAIs. Within the first 10 million years of solar system formation, the massive gas rich disk that surrounds the star is gone. The giant planets have formed. And we have, in the next 10 to 100 million years, planets that form, differentiate, giant impacts that occur. And today, what we see is a solar system with four terrestrial planets, four giant planets further out. But in order to really understand this process, we can't actually watch a solar system evolve over billions of years. We don't have the time to sit there and watch it evolve. And so what we do is we probe different solar systems ast astronomically, we do experiments, we calculate models, and we probe the remnants of the early solar system, meteorites, in order to truly understand what has occurred over billions of years, but in the context of this talk, um, the first 100 million years or so of solar system formation. When you talk about accretion, it's a really big topic. And so if you look at the research over the years, it can really be boiled down to several questions. What is the Earth made of? How did the Earth form? Where did the moon come from? And what about the Earth's accretion makes it the habitable planet that we live on today? For the next hour, the five of us will um, focus on these four questions and talk about the past, the present, and how we see the future, um, where the future is headed in the research in these topics. So let's start with what is the Earth made of? This is um, an article from the transactions of the American Geophysical Union in 1926. And Henry Washington, this third man in the picture over there, then a staff member at the Geophysical Lab, and to be later the fourth president of the American Geophysical Union, notes that it's really fascinating that some of the most abundant elements on Earth happen to also be some of the most abundant elements in the sun. And he notes that in order to really understand where the Earth came from, we really need to understand the composition of the Earth and why it's so similar to the composition of the sun. We now, of course, know that the composition of the Earth is, uh, excuse me, of the Sun is extremely similar to a composition of a certain type of meteorite called carbonaceous chondrites, CI chondrites in particular. And you see the slope one line that basically shows that the compositions are very similar. The deviations from the slope one line are then used to argue for certain processes that have occurred to change the composition um, since the accretion of the solar system. But on top of just um, elemental abundances, we can also look at isotopic abundances. And that previous plot has then um, allowed the creation of what we term now the chondritic reference model. What this basically means is that we assume that since chondrites, since these primitive meteorites were formed at the same time as our planets in the same disk around our star, they should have approximately the same bulk composition. Of course, we know that all the planets in our solar system do not have exactly the same bulk composition, but the chondritic reference uh, model has been very useful in understanding and trying to understand the bulk composition of the Earth. And so not only can we look at elemental uh, deviations from chondrites, but we can look at isotopic ones as well. There are many, many systems I could have chosen in order to show you this, but I've just chosen three as an example, because you can do this in both the stable or the radiogenic isotopic systems. So on the left, you see the iron isotopic system, and it's been argued that some of the deviations in, this, in the iron isotopic composition of certain planetary bodies are due to planetary scale processes, such as core formation, or such as the evaporation um, of elements during the giant impacts. In the middle, you see neodymium isotopic composition. You can see the terrestrial samples um, are different than chondrites, and this has been used as an argument for a hidden primordial reservoir that is complementary to the terrestrial samples um, some, hidden somewhere within the Earth. And lastly, on the right, you see the most classical of these isotopic systems, the oxygen isotopic system. 
The oxygen isotopic system has been used um, in terms of planetary genetics and in trying to fingerprint the, planet, the parental bodies from which meteorites um, have come from. Each parental body has a different line in this space, and you can see, for example, the Earth and the Moon lie on the same identical oxygen isotopic system, and we'll come back to that later. But these planetary genetics um, also are used in terms of trying to understand the building blocks of the Earth. And Rich Walker, in his talk, will discuss a new planetary genetic system that uh, we're currently um, researching. So if we then take the silicate Earth and we compare it to chondrites, we see that the lithophile elements, the ones that go into the silicate portion of the planet, are all very similar to chondrites. But what you see in blue and red are the siderophile elements. And those are the ones that are iron loving. And you can see that they're depleted in the silicate Earth. This has been used as a fingerprint of core formation. And the amount of depletion of these elements has been used as a way of trying to get at the conditions under which the core formed. The differentiation of the Earth is by far the most dramatic and the most important chemical event that the Earth underwent. It drastically changed the composition of the different layers of the Earth and has made it very difficult for us to disentangle what the bulk composition of the Earth really is because we don't have any samples of the majority of the Earth. Further, it's been, uh, we now know that there was enough aluminum-26 in the early solar system in order to melt planetesimals even within the first three to four million years of solar system formation so that we now know that the Earth was actually formed from differentiated bodies and not necessarily from primitive meteorites. So if we go back to um, the very first uh, AGU meeting in 1920, there were seven questions that were outlined as the most important of the time. And the seventh was entitled, An Outline of Geophysical Chemical Problems. It's very general. Um, and that was written by, oh, excuse me. That was written by this man, Dr. Sossman. And what he says is he basically explains that one of the most important things in understanding the Earth is understanding how the physical properties of the rocks, of the things that make up the Earth, um, change as a function of the conditions under which they are. So he spends the first half of the paper discussing the surface of the Earth and the different chemical and physical properties of those materials. But then he spends the second half talking about the interior of the Earth. And what he says is that we have no idea. He actually says it's our knowledge is equivalent to almost total ignorance as of 1920 of what happens at high pressure to these materials. In 1926, Hale writes in the Transactions of the American, American, American Geophysical Union that the center of the Earth is largely a large ball of iron. So if we put these together and we ask what happens to this large ball of iron and these silicates at high pressure, as of 1920, we knew very little. Of course, he's foreshadowing how important experimental petrology and mineral physics will become in the next 100 years. And truly, there have been thousands and thousands of experiments that have been done in order to understand just this. What happens to silicate and metal at high pressure and temperature? Where do the different elements partition as we change the oxygen fugacity, the pressure, the temperature, the composition? What, where do all the different elements partition? This is actually crucially important for the history of the Earth. Depending on where the different elements partition, you'll have a vastly different evolution of the planet. You'll have a completely different heat budget. You will um, ultimately, um, it, it, that will ultimately tie to the habitability of the planet. Whether or not you have a geodynamo, for example, is tied to the composition of the core versus the mantle. And in 1920, in that same article, Sossman notes that the pressures that they can get to at that point in the lab are up to about 1.2 GPA, which is approximately 40 kilometers depth within the Earth. Today, we can get to pressures and temperatures well within the interiors of exoplanets, of super-Earths, with the use of shock waves or novel diamond anvil cells. So what about how did the Earth form, right? So it, we have learned a lot about the composition of the Earth, but how did it form? How did that dust and gas disk then turn into planets. Well, in 19, uh, the first mention I could actually find of this in the transactions of the AGU wasn't until 1950, which was about 12 years before the AGU formally had a planetary science division. And in this paper by Benfield, he, he says that it's obvious that the Earth melted at some point, but did it start melted? Did it start from colder particles? They, were, they weren't really sure how the how the uh, planets could have melted at that point at a later stage. He notes 
that the Earth might even be 7 billion years old. And what we know now, of course, is that the Earth, that these condensates, and the, um, the very first condensates formed from a hot gas that was cooling. But how did those particles that condensed from that hot gas then form planets? Well, with this, we need to go to models. And so this model on the left, a la George Wetherill or John Chambers, shows a planetesimal accretion model. The idea is that these particles um, bounce and collide and, come and are bound together through gravitational accretion, and they form larger and larger planetary embryos as they collide with one another. The initial conditions for this disk are that all the gas is gone, okay? So the giant planets have already formed, the gas is gone, and the material in the disk is uniformly distributed within the first four AU or so. The problem with this model, as you can see, is that even though it's able to um, predict Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars in their approximate right positions, Mars is huge, right? Mars is bigger than the Earth, and this is termed the small Mars problem. And so the idea is that how do you get Mars to actually be the right size? And to answer that question, more recently there's been a model entitled the Grand Tack. And what the Grand Tack shows is it shows the mi inward migration of Jupiter that then goes into resonance with Saturn and then comes back out. And what it does is it takes all the material in front of it and it pushes it forward into the first one AU. It also pushes volatiles into the first one AU, so it's a way of allowing more volatile delivery to the terrestrial planets. And it basically starves Mars of material so that it can't form a bigger planet. Um, and so that is a way of getting around the small Mars problem. Seth will talk about a new model um, different than this planetary accretion model in his talk. And so then we talk about the moon. Where did the moon come from? People have been fascinated with the moon forever because we can look up and see it. In 1927, um, F.E. Wright wrote about the moon in the transactions of the American Geophysical Union, and he notes, he, he really questions where the craters came from. Are they volcanic eruptions? Are they impacts? He's not really sure. But what he ponders at the end of the paper is what these craters have to do with the origin of the moon, and what, where exactly did the moon come from, and why is it important for the accretion of the Earth? We now know, or think we know, that the um, Earth formed, uh, that the Moon formed from a giant impact between a precursor, a, a precursor planet and the Earth. This is a classical model showing a impactor hitting the Earth and then a debris disk forming around the planet. This debris disk is made mostly from the impactor and then it goes on to um, gravitationally accrete and form the Moon. This event, this giant impact, is the last major final event in Earth's accretion. And it's cr critically important for the then evolution of the planet from then on. But there's a problem with this model, and that is if the moon is formed just from this impactor, um, mostly from this impactor that formed the debris disk, then we have a problem because most recently it's been shown that the isotopes in many different isotopic systems of the Earth and the Moon are basically identical in many, many systems. Way too many systems for it to be a coincidence. And so unless the impactor had exactly the same isotopic composition as the Earth, we need a new way of understanding how all these isotopic systems could be so similar. And Sarah and Razvan are gonna discuss this giant impact more in their talks. And when we do find an isotopic difference between the Earth and the Moon, such as in these very volatile elements, it's then used as a way to help understand the conditions of that giant impact. And so in this case, they're arguing for a very saturated gas that was able to fractionate the Earth and Moon in these volatile elements. Okay, so we've talked about the accretion of the Earth, but the title of this talk is The Accretion of a Habitable Planet. Well, it turns out the Earth is the only habitable planet we know of. So the accretion of the Earth is the accretion of a habitable planet. It's very hard not to be Earth-centric when we talk about habitability because it's the only known life that we know. And so if we think about why we have life on Earth, what is it about this planet? In the context of our neighborhood in AGU, right, the Earth's interior, what is it about the Earth itself that allowed the Earth to be habitable? What is it about that accretional history that then made the Earth a place where life was welcome to exist. And if we look at certain features of the Earth, for example, the ability to have liquid water, plate tectonics, and a magnetic field, we see that these are really manifestations or outcomes of this accretional history of the Earth. It is the planet itself that has allowed these features to exist. 
And it's important for the, in, in my opinion, it's important for the history um, of, of the Earth to be a vital part of understanding habitability of planets in general. So as an example, on the left, we have a habitable planet. We have plate tectonics that stabilize um, the climate at the surface and allow heat to be lost, um, which thereby allows a magnetic field to be generated, which then shields not only the water on the surface, but also um, shields the surface from harmful radiation. On the right, we have a planet with a stagnant lid that insulates the interior, and it doesn't allow heat to escape, therefore not allowing magnetic field to be generated and allowing water to be lost to space, thereby rendering a, a too hot and dry surface where life cannot exist. So in the context of the Earth's interior, it is crucially important in the future to understand which of these features is the most important for creating this habitable planet. An enormous amount of work needs to be done in order to truly understand what it is about these features and the evolution of the Earth that has allowed the Earth to be what it is um, today. And we have now hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of other planets to look at and to um, learn from. We now know that our solar system is actually quite unique in terms of its architecture, in terms of the type of planets that we have in our solar system. We don't have a super Earth, for example, which is the most common planet that's been found in exoplanets. And so as we build up our statistics over the years with more and more and more exoplanets, we're able to talk about planet formation and accretion in a more general way because we have many more planets and many more opportunities to look. And truly the future is interdisciplinary. As we have models that um, with better computing time, our models will get better. Uh, will get better. As our experiments are able to get to higher pressures, higher pressures and temperatures, our experiments will get better. As new telescopes come online that are larger and that are able to really see smaller objects in space, all of these ways will help us understand and, and really get at the accretion of the Earth and of other planets. But in order to understand it, we really need to work together across disciplines. This is not um, a place where a geochemist can work alone. A geochemist needs to work with a geophysicist and an astronomer, for example, in order to truly understand what it is that makes these planets habitable. And we really need to focus on the Earth in that it is, once again, the only habitable planet we know of yet. So I'd like to finish, lastly, by showing um, this picture. This is a picture of the 1923 AGU meeting. It's on the steps of the Carnegie Institution in Washington, DC, which is where I work. Um, and these men did a really, really great job and wrote a lot of really brilliant papers that have really grounded and enlightened a lot of the work that we do today. However, the future looks quite different. And the future in this AGU community is much more diverse and will have a lot of really brilliant and wonderful and new and exciting ideas for the next 100 years. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm Seth Jacobson. I'm, I'm from a uh, professor at Michigan State University. And today, I want to I want to talk about something that's that's new in, in planetary science and in, in planet formation that might really radically alter the way we think about the growth of the Earth. And that's this new paradigm of pebble accretion, which very uh, pebble accretion sort of. Uh, is necessary to explain the, the growth of the giant planets. And, and today what I'm gonna try and do is in five minutes explain to you what physically is going on from an astrophysical perspective. And that's really necessary because I think in order for us to distinguish the planet, the planetesimal accretion hypothesis or this traditional hypothesis of planet formation from this new paradigm of pebble accretion will really require the input of geochemists and cosmochemists. And it's really gonna be the geochemistry and cosmochemistry of the Earth that can distinguish between these two hypotheses. Uh, so let's get started. And I think it's really exciting in the, uh, that you know, we're 100 years into the AGU, and, and, you know, in, in, but in the last decade, we're still coming up with new ways of making planets, which is pretty cool. So pebble accretion comes from a problem that actually exists in the outer solar system. So we know that the giant planets must accrete a lot of nebular gas, a lot of hydrogen and helium. And, but uh, this 
has to occur very rapidly. Uh, this means that the, the, the core of the giant plant has to grow very quickly in a few million years while the gas is still around. Uh, traditional plantosomal accretion struggles to grow giant planet cores that quickly. Often they take 100 million or even a billion years to grow in the outer solar system, far too long. And so pebble accretion solves this problem by greatly increasing the accretional cross section of a planetary embryo embedded in a nebular disk. And so now I'm gonna try and explain to you how it does that. So first, before we get into the physics of pebble accretion, I gotta explain to you what are pebbles. So we think of pebbles, we often think of river stones, like uh, these pebbles on the Nice beach. The, while these are what uh, uh, give the pebbles their name because they're about the same size as these astrophysical pebbles, we're not talking about river stones here. We're also not really talking about the fragments we find on the surface of asteroids like Bennu, here imaged by the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft. The, these are uh, crushed uh, uh, um, rocks that have been broken apart. What we're really talking about when we talk about pebbles are these astrophysical objects that have grown through binary pairwise accretion from the first condensates in the solar system and surviving pre-solar materials and have grown uh, through collisions and interlocking of grains and van der Waals forces up to what astrophysicists refer to as the bouncing or fragmentation barriers. So from laboratory experiments at drop towers and other low G environments, we've learned that objects can grow to about a centimeter, maybe, a mi maybe millimeters or decimeters in other cases in size, and then they really can't grow any further. And this actually makes a lot of sense intuitively if we think back to those river stones. No matter how hard you throw two river stones or gently you place them next to each other, they will not make a single object. And that's fundamentally what's at the heart of the bouncing or fragmentation barrier. What's interesting is that this then predicts that disks should be filled with millimeter and centimeter sized objects, and that's exactly what we see when we look at them in the radio. So what is pebble accretion? So here, uh, I'm, I'm gonna show a simple diagram to explain it. We just see energy plotted on the y-axis, and we have our pebble or planetesimal up on the top. And it's gonna fall into this uh, uh, potential well, the gravity well created by a planet, and, uh, and we're gonna see what happens. So for our planetesimal, which is shown over here, it flies past the planet and is deflected by the planetesimal and our ball, it goes into the well, speeds up, and then exits the well on the other side. And that's because gravity is a fundamentally a, a, a conservative force. Energy is conserved, the energy is transferred potential to kinetic back to potential. But then we think of our pebble. And something very different happens with our pebble in the gas. And that's because our pebble, unlike our planetesimal, which is a very large 100,000, you know, 100 kilometer object, maybe tens of kilometers, that doesn't care about the aerodynamic drag present in the disk, our pebble cares a lot about that drag. And so it, as it enters into the potential well of the planet, it becomes trapped. And so we can see in the simulation on the right, instead of just getting deflected past the planetary embryo, it gets captured in that potential and spirals into the planet. And so it's just like a ball rolling into a hill with, uh, 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 into a valley with friction. So what this does is it greatly increases the cross section uh, from which a planet can draw in material. And so that's why pebble accretion is so efficient. And what does that mean for the formation of the Earth? Well, it means that we can have a radically different picture of how the terrestrial planets formed. Instead of the, the picture envisioned by people like George Wetherill of 40 or 50 planetary embryos, growing through lots of violent collisions, creating lots of debris, which by the way, I'll note, we do not see in the solar system. We could imagine a world where there's only four or five embryos that grow uh, successfully through this plant, this pebble accretion mechanism. And, uh, and just one of the, there's this small instability at the end that leads a, a potentially a Theia hitting the Earth-like planet. And I'll note in my last 20 seconds that there's already some geochemical claimed evidence for this scenario. So Schiller et al. using the calcium-48 isotope system uh, makes this argument <clears throat> that they see a trend in, in uh, 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 stable uh, nucleosynthetic isotopes in calcium-48, and from that trend they, uh, they deduce that the inner solar system was filled with a bunch of uraelite uh, 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 planetary embryos that each accreted a different amount of, of ci chondrite like uh, pebbles. So I, I don't have time to go into too much detail, uh, but this is uh, the first geochemical evidence to try and break these two hypotheses apart. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave my conclusions up for a second.
We have known about planets for millennia, but it was only 13 years ago that we wrote down a formal definition for what is a planet. A planet is a body in hydrostatic equilibrium. It has enough self-gravity to give the body its rounded shape, like these spherical planets colliding in this image. At the time we came up with this definition, we knew that a body could be too small to be a planet, too cold and small for self-gravity to deform the body into a spherical object. Such bodies are things like asteroids and comets. But what we have learned in the past few years is that a planet can be too large to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. A few years ago, we discovered a new object that we named a Synestia. It is what is made when a planet exceeds the limit of hydrostatic equilibrium. Think of the key parameter being synchronous orbit. Today, geosynchronous orbit is about 35,000 kilometers away. It's about five times Earth radius. But during the energetic process of making a Earth-like planet, the planet can spin quickly enough, sp perhaps with a day of only a few hours, so that synchronous orbit is much closer, within two times Earth's present radius. The energy of a giant impact is enough to expand the equatorial radius beyond that distance. At that point, it is impossible to describe the object with the equations of hydrostatic equilibrium. In fact, the object doesn't have a simple sh shape that stays the same with time. It's constantly changing its hydrodynamic. This is something that was a surprise. We did not predict the existence of synestias. We have been studying giant impacts for 50 years, but our assumptions about what was occurring during planet formation kept us from understanding that these new objects were forming. I have a visualization of the creation of a synestia from a giant amp impact. This was created by the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. In this example, the pre-existing planet is spinning rapidly. It has an extremely oblate shape. There are oceans, atmospheres, and in a few minutes, the surface, the crust, the oceans, the atmospheres are all vaporized by the energy of a giant impact, forming a rock vapor with dissolved water and gases surrounding a high pressure, high temperature liquid interior. We have no intuition for the energy of this event. The kinetic energy of that impactor divided by the hours time scale is the power of a giant impact. The power of, gi of a giant impact is comparable to the power of the sun. That much power transforms these planets into a new object that we call a synestia. We proposed last year that the reason why our moon has such similar chemical and isotopic characteristics to the Earth is because it formed within the outer regions of a synestia. This is one of many discoveries that occurred over the past 100 years. And admit it, many of our discoveries were actually surprises. When we look forward to trying to understand the, the world of exoplanets and our own planet's formation, remember this anecdote. We only realized recently that there was a limit to the definition of planets. We understood that planets could be too small, but now we understood that, understand that planets can be too big. And when we try to explain the different objects that we see in exoplanets that we don't have in our own solar system, ask yourselves the question, what are we missing? What assumptions are we imposing upon the great diversity of exoplanets that are keeping us from seeing their true nature? And if we can peel away those assumptions, what wonders will we reveal and discover about planets in the universe? Thank you.
All right, thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, genetics. I'm going to talk about uh, genetics, though, that uh, do not define uh, who your ancestors were or, heaven forbid, your dog's ancestors, but I'm going to discuss planetary genetics. And so I think, as most of you know, you're really just a collection of variable proportions of uh, pre-solar dust. Uh, the picture on the uh, left there is a picture of a uh, pre-solar grain, and the picture on the right is of a, of a solar nebula type uh, occurrence. And uh, pre-solar grains in our solar nebula were unevenly distributed for reasons that we're still debating. And so what I'm going to be talking about is the fact that your planetary genetic makeup is really defined by the proportions of the pre-solar materials ultimately incorporated in your planet, the Earth. And so to illustrate that, I want to start off with an isotopic uh, composition slide. This is a composition of the element titanium. In this case, the isotope titanium-50 varies in nature as a consequence of variable uh, nucleosynthetic uh, processes that acted on pre-solar grains. So at the top of that uh, figure, you can see a, a very large range in titanium isotopic composition. Whereas all bulk meteorites, Earth and Mars, fall in a very narrow field on this plot. So in the next slide, I'm going to move to a much uh, higher resolution version of that plot. Although in this case, I'm plotting on the vertical scale titanium-50 and on the horizontal scale a, uh, another very common uh, element, chromium, and this is chromium-54. The thing to notice about this slide is that there's considerable variability in the chromium and titanium isotopic compositions of planetary objects. So all of the symbols in that diagram are meteorites. There's also a symbol for Mars. You are in the yellow star there. The other things to notice, which you can't see in this figure very well, are that your uh, genetics with regard to chromium and titanium are most similar to a type of meteorite called enstatite chondrites. And finally, if you look carefully at this diagram, you'll see that the data fall into two clusters with a gap that is labeled here between the two groups. And about 10 years ago, it was recognized by people working on these isotopic compositions that these two clusters of data really are separate from one another with a gap between. And uh, Paul Warren, in a 2011 paper, defined uh, the red group, which you are a member of, as uh, non-carbonaceous and the blue group, because at the time it consisted almost entirely of carbonaceous chondrites, called that the carbonaceous chondrite type. So uh, we have kind of divided the solar system into what are termed NC and CC groups, which are genetic groups. The other thing to notice in this slide is that the Earth, the yellow star, plots pretty close to the gap. And uh, that tells us that although the Earth is NC, it may include a significant proportion of CC material. So some studies have suggested that NC materials formed inboard of the proto-Jupiter, perhaps uh, Jupiter that was moving in and out, and that CC is formed outboard. So uh, the takeaway home message to start off with here is you are NC, and you can go to the gift shop here and get a we are NC hat. I also want to uh, look at uh, siderophile elements, which are not mentioned. Siderophile elements are elements that are concentrated in our core because they're iron loving. A good example of a siderophile element is gold. They're an interesting group of elements because by and large, the siderophile elements that are here with you on the surface of the earth and in the mantle uh, were probably added relatively late in the accretionary sequence of the Earth. Again, uh, this is a plot of ruthenium now versus molybdenum. Again, you see red and blue um, groups. You see a gap. In this case, though, the yellow star is furthest from the gap, and this suggests that maybe the siderophile elements uh, that are contained in the silicate Earth uh, are somewhat genetically different from that of the uh, main lithophile elements like chromium and titanium. So your gold stuff is also NC. Uh, in the case of siderophile elements, your closest relative are group 1AB iron meteorites. If you've ever been to Meteor Crater in Arizona, that was made by a group 1AB iron meteorites. And again, the difference in where the Earth plots, and therefore you plot on those diagrams, between the lithophile and the siderophile elements is probably the accretionary sequence. 
So a lot of questions remain regarding uh, genetics. Uh, did planetary genetics vary radially from the sun? Did planetary genetics vary with time in the early nebula? And uh, how and where and why were these uh, separate uh, genetic groups um, housed for some period of time? So uh, to sum up, this is the takeaway slide. Your closest living um, biological relative is on the left, but your planetary relations are shown on the right. Thank you. So what atoms can tell us about the protolunar disk and the synestia? In order to answer this question, we need to uh, bring in thermodynamics. So in a temperature density space, which is very different than what you usually see in your petrology classes, solids are stable at low temperature and high density. At higher temperature, the stability field goes into liquids, and then at low densities, you have gases. Everything that is gray in this diagram doesn't exist as a single phase. For example, along the melting line, you have at the same temperature liquids and solids with different density and in equilibrium. And the, sa the same happens at the liquid vapor dome, where gases and liquids are at equilibrium, same temperature, different densities. The end of the dome of the liquid vapor dome is the critical point that separates the start of the supercritical fluid. When the impact happened, the initial state of the proto, uh, of the proto earth represented in light red here, was raised, each part of this, uh, of this protoers were raised according at higher densities and considerably higher temperatures according to the shock equations of state, the Hugonio lines. Once this shock wave of the giant impact passed, the, the, re the resulting disk, the resulting synestia, started to cool down and to condense along paths of isoentropic. Uh, thermodynamic, so a path that conserved the entropy represented here by the green lines. If the critical point is relatively low in temperature and density, then the disk would evolve in one phase as a supercritical fluid for a long time. But if this critical point is high either in temperature or in density, then the disk would quickly hit the liquid vapor dome and then you would have a separation of gas and the liquids. The two disks would evolve along different thermodynamic paths and their properties would be different. So we employed atomistic simulations, ab initio molecular dynamics, to sample the relevant thermodynamic space of the proto-Earth and of the proto-lunar disk. We calculated, for example, the liquid spinodal line, which marks the, the minimum density of stability and metastability of the liquids. Left of this line, you need to have gas and liquid separation. The spinodal line ends in the critical point. Now, we can have a look at what happens with our uh, bulk silicate earths, our, uh, our silicate system, inside the liquid vapor dome and left of the liquid spinodal. These molecular dynamic simulations, the atomistic simulations, give us a lot of information of what happens with the atoms at, this, at these conditions. For example, we can measure diffusion. We can calculate interatomic distances. From there, we can obtain chemical speciation. The yellow atoms here, for example, which are represented by, uh, which are uh, the, the silicon atoms, are bonded most of the time by four oxygen atoms represented in red. They form the SiO4 tetrahedra, which, is which are characteristic to the silicate liquids at these low densities and temperatures. And as I was speaking up, you probably noticed that a cavity, an open space, opened up inside the, in the, inside the silicate liquid. Now, in this cavity, you can have molecules and atoms and clusters of atoms that detach from the, from the walls of the cavity, float freely inside, and come back. This is a gas bubble. So we can witness and we can capture the formation of the gas bubbles and the start of the separation of the gases and of the liquids. 
we can also do thermodynamics. We can go back and calculate those shock equations of state, the hugoniolites, and we have done this for the crust, the mantle, and the core. The resulting uh, equations of state tell us that the synestia or the protolunar disk evolved at high temperatures most of the time as a super liquid fluid as a single phase. Such a disk should be well mixed. We also predict partial core vaporization during the giant impact, and we can estimate the loss of volatiles. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one question. If anybody would like to ask the panel a question, simply raise your hand and Kelly, our AGU staffer, will be happy to run on your, uh, on your left there, Kelly. Coming at you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Sarah, you referred to a Synestia as an astronomical object. What astronomical data on Synestia are there, observational data? There, there are no observational data as of yet, but they are observable uh, should we be lucky enough to uh, see one through a telescope. Uh, so there are calculations of what they would look like if we were um, looking for an exoplanet and instead uh, observed the Synestia. They are very short-lived astronomical objects. Um, and so we would have to be very lucky at this point. They exist at, our, at, at, at this time within our computers and with our pencils, yes. Okay. Next question for the panel. How many Theas were there in the inner solar system and what was their fate? Is, is this a question for me? Uh, sure. Okay. The, the George Wetherill scenario would suggest between 30 and 40 Mars-like embryos at the beginning of the, of the solar system. They emerge from... So he and, and people like Shigeru Ida, dis, and uh, they describe this process of runaway growth followed by oligarchic growth and the emergence of these oligarchs. So that'd be 30 or 40 oligarchs of roughly Mars-sized mass, of, of which they collect to make the about two Earth mass planets at the end of planet formation. The pebble accretion model suggests a radically different idea. So in this model, planetesimal formation is driven through a, a gravitational instability-like process that creates just a few very large uh, planetesimals that then can uh, uh, get, grow through planetesimal accretion just to the edge where they can start to uh, grow efficiently through pebble accretion, and then they launch, they take off and grow rapidly. And so you'll end up with, in this model, you might have as few as five objects with only one or two Mars-sized objects. Um, and so it's, it's a radically different way of thinking about uh, planet formation in the end. In, the, in this model, yes, they would be the last one. And so th perhaps uh, people have talked about a, 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 a giant planet instability, uh, a nice-like instability to describe the orbits of the giant planets. Such an instability could also have triggered uh, an instability amongst the terrestrial planets. It could have led to perhaps our fifth, our lost uh, embryo striking uh, the Earth, the proto-Earth, and creating this, uh, this giant impact that we see. Time for one more question. The Synestia and the, uh, appeared in several, two of the talks. So the final talk, uh, the iron at the center of it is extremely hot and becomes miscible with a silicate. Uh, uh, for the actual Earth we have, this seems to run afoul of tungsten isotopes and that the tungsten isotopes would re-equilibrate between the um, metal and the core and we'd have chondritic uh, tungsten isotopes rather than a uh, highly fractionated one. So uh, comment maybe from both of you or one, which whoever wants to take it. Um, so our chemical evidence for accretion bounds the amount of iron that could dissolve with the silicate. And so it does depend on the specifics of the giant impact, how much could become dissolved because uh, the, the cores do not break into fine enough pieces to, to completely interact with the mantles. Thank you. No 
please join me to thank the panel. They did an amazing job at starting this day. If, if anybody is interested in discussing this any further, the panel is going to move next door to the networking space, and in five minutes or so, the next section will go on. Thank you.